Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to be reading today verses 15 through 22. This is the word of the Lord to us. Therefore he, that is Jesus, the Lord, he is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgression committed under the first covenant. For where will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Let's pray one more time. Father, I bow before you and ask now that you take your word and bless your people. This mighty truth, it is beyond me. Please work as only you can do. In the precious name of Christ, I pray, amen. Amen. Well, I love the Bible and this church, we want you to love the Bible, to love God's word. And I I love the book of Hebrews. Seems like every book I teach becomes my favorite book. But I love Hebrews, I love the Christology that the way we get high biblical Christology about our Lord in this book is, is just amazing to me. And really, it's, it's, it's a sermon, it's a homily, it's full of instruction, it's full of exhortations, it's full of warnings, it's full of rebukes, it's also full of comforts and encouragements, and it helps us on in the pilgrimage of the Christian life. This book will help you on. And we see that the Lord Jesus Christ in this book is preeminent. He is the greatest of all. None can compare with him. He's preeminent. He's the one through whom God has spoken in these last days, he said. I spoke at times past through the prophets in these last days. He spoke through his son. And so he's the greatest of the prophets. And he's the one who's the great king, the great king sitting at the right hand of God with the scepter of uprightness, the scepter of righteousness. He's anointed with the oil of gladness, we're told. And he is the one who laid the foundations of the earth. Isn't that incredible? And the heavens are the work of his hands. He's the one who upholds the universe by the word of his power. And he's the exact radiance of the glory of God. This is who we're speaking about, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who the holy angels worship. Don't let that one get by you. There are times in the Bible where an apostle, John, would be tempted to worship an angel. And they would say, no, no, only worship God. They don't worship anyone, the holy angels, but God. They worship Christ. So we've seen in the last few chapters here that he is the great high priest, he's a prophet, he's a king, and he's the great priest. The great high priest who can sympathize with all of your weaknesses and he's ready to give mercy and grace to help in time of need. This is good news. And this section of Hebrews that I'm in, I wondered if I should just preach it when it became my turn to preach or find something else. And as I read it, I thought, no, this is right where I am and may it bless you all today. Because this section in chapter five of Hebrews, if you know this book, chapter five through really most of chapter 10 is the central heart and message of the whole book. And the theme 
you could say is redemptive sacrifice. Redemptive sacrifice. And in a way, redemptive sacrifice is the theme of the entirety of the Bible. You see that at the beginning in Genesis all the way down to the end in the last page in Revelation. Redemptive sacrifice. So I hope to preach to you today the subject is the saving blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The saving blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've just been told that this great Christ has appeared on earth there earlier in chapter 9. A high priest of the good things to, to, that have come. And he has secured for us an eternal redemption. And he did it by his blood. He entered heaven by his own blood, not by the blood of bulls and goats, not sacrificial animals, his own blood. And this eternal redemption is secured by him. It's secured. It, it, it's not made possible. It is secured. It is completed. It is established forever by him. He who has an indestructible life, is he is the one who has laid down his life so that the ransom for your soul can be paid. And he's paid it. He's paid the price we could never pay. This is his work for us. And if we look at verse 15, he starts off with the word therefore. Now this tells us the author is giving us a reason or an explanation for what he's just been saying. In fact, he's expositing from chapter 8 verse 1 all through now. He's, he's telling us an eternal redemption is yours. Now a Hebrew person reading this, this is, this is off the charts. I mean, it should be for us too, but them in their culture, an eternal redemption that requires no more sacrifices, no more temple, no more showbread, no more of the menorah candle, no more altar of incense, no more ark of the covenant and the mercy seat, no more of all that. That's right. We, we need to know that for this reason, Jesus Christ is the mediator of a new covenant. That first covenant is gone. It grew old. It vanished away, as we're told in, the, in these verses. It's over. It has no more validity. It, ha, it does not have any saving or redeeming power at all. It's all fulfilled in our great mediator. The Lord Jesus actually fulfilled what the first covenant pointed to in its shadows and copies and types. He fulfilled it. He completed it. And then he brought it to a close. He ended it. And even where the first covenant had its weaknesses, we're told, it has its weaknesses in a few places. He had no weaknesses. He made up for all of that. And he has accomplished it. He had the strength to accomplish all of that. And now the new and better and eternal covenant, we're told, is established in his blood. Now let's keep in mind something important. The new covenant was one that Jeremiah prophesied about in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. And our author here in Hebrews quotes it at length in chapter eight. But think about this, Jeremiah, this was hundreds of years before Christ came, before John the Baptist came. It was hundreds of years. Remember, God had established the kings. He had the king after his own heart, David, made the promise to him. Then all of us, after David, it's like there was this downward trajectory, wasn't there? I mean, there were some good kings that would come back, but if it's like a stock market chart, it's mostly going down. There's some ups, but then back down until finally, Jeremiah's prophesying saying, the nation of Israel is going to get vomited out of the land, kicked out. You're gonna be gone. It's gonna be for 70 years. But then he gave this little glimmer of hope in telling us, but God has promised he's gonna make a new covenant. That is the hope, and now Christ has fulfilled that hope. And this new covenant, it was made between God and the Lord Jesus. It's not like the first covenant, where God told Moses, you tell people to stand back, stay away, and then you tell them, if they do this and do that, then they can live, they can stay in the land and they'll do well. But if they don't, they're gonna break the covenant. It's not like that. It's with Christ. We have a mediator. It's him going to Christ saying, you do this, you do that, and they can live and do well. 
This is, he's our mediator. He's the one who goes before God on our behalf. And he's the one who secures our salvation for us. In this passage right here, we're gonna see more about how this works with regards to another aspect of covenant making, which is why the ESV, and if you have a King James, New King James, NIV maybe, and some other translations translate the word as a will or a testament. And in the Greek, it's the same word. It's the same word. Covenant, will, testament, it's all the same word, just based on the context is how you translate it and interpret it. So some very key words in this passage are the words inheritance and will. This ought to excite us. I'm sure there may be some of you out there who there is an inheritance coming to you and it may have you happy or excited, right? An anticipation. These are the words he's using. Think about an inheritance. At the very fundamental level, what is that? I hope, I hope you realize it's something of value, money, property, something of worth that's coming to you, but it's something you did not work for. Someone else worked for it. Someone else earned it, but you are the recipient of it. And some, some of you kids, I don't know why, some of my kids are playing Monopoly, they're just loving it even the younger ones. And you, you got a card sometimes you'll draw and it'll say, you have inherited, what? I can't remember, $200, something like that. You have inherited $200, take your money from the bank. Nothing's stopping that kid from getting their $200 out of that bank, right? Why? Because they inherited the $200. Well, it's an inheritance. It's, it's money or property or anything of value that is passed down, typically from parents to children or the proverbial rich uncle that doesn't have any kids and he liked you. And so he's gonna pass on some, his wealth to you. Or it could be a friend, it could be anyone who writes you into their will. Now what, what's a will? A will is a written legal document declaring who gets what, right? It's written down, it's officially established in writing and it has multiple witnesses. You can't just up and decide and grab a piece of paper and pretend like you're your dad and say, hey, I, uh, John or Jeff gets $2 million, take it to an attorney, to the bank and try to get it. It won't work like that. It's gotta be witnessed, it's gotta be authenticated. And it's an official document, okay? And so who's the one who makes the decisions about what goes into that will? What gets written in? Who makes the decisions? person who owns the property or the money or the valuable stuff, right? So they're also known as the testator, the testator. This is the one who makes the decision. The will depends solely and only upon the desire of the testator. Now we're heading somewhere with these truths. Daddy decides, or mama, or grandpa, right? Not you. So be careful, kids. If they're still alive, they can do that if they want to, right? Well, another way of understanding a written will is with the word testament. Testament. A will could be also called someone's last will and testament. And it, to me, it's interesting to note that we have in our Bibles both an old and a new testament. That's what we call them. It's what everyone calls the Bible. The Old and New Testament combined is our Holy Scriptures, word from God. And at this point in Hebrews, the author's getting into this great reality of how this works. Now, this will and testament was drafted in eternity by the divine council or within the Trinity. There was a, there was a Trinitarian agreement. We heard a lot about that in this morning's study on the work of the Spirit. There is a pact and this is not some plan B, this new covenant. And before Christ appeared, before he came, this was all handed down as a promise in the form of a promise. A promise even from God to Abraham. Before that, it was a promise from God to Adam even. So this promise is being carried forward. And finally, or eventually, this promise came down in shadow form in the old covenant. The copy and shadow form was established right there. And then even later on, when the kings are like going like this, 
there are still some good prophets God raised up. Isaiah is one of them. And the prophets started seeing things. God started showing them and they started writing about it. Just consider what Isaiah saw in Isaiah 53. I mean, that is amazing. The suffering servant. And so the light got brighter and brighter until Christ finally came and established it, confirmed it or completed it. He completed it. So in one sense, I hope you find this very liberating because the stipulations for this covenant being carried out and fulfilled has nothing to do with you or your works. Nothing. Nothing to do with your performance. It's not in there. Your good works, your sins, your failures, your strivings, your good efforts, all of that, none of these things have anything to do with it. It's all about the accomplishments, the prayers, the sufferings, of our great mediator. It all depends on him. So this is what makes him also our savior, our savior. Now verses 16 and 17 say in essence, where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. It only has force and power and standing legally when the one who made it is dead. You see that? That's what gives it its power. That person's death, the testator's death, gives this sheet of paper, gives this testament, gives this will its power, its authority, its force, if I can put it that way. And it must be enforced. If the person who made it is still alive, it's not in effect yet. Then this is how human society works. I mean, this is, this is real power even now. If, you have a, if there's a will in your name and that, the, the one who wrote it, the testator dies, you have something powerful in your hands with that will. It must be carried out. You know, if, if a father and mother say in their will that their last $200 goes to Jimmy, Jimmy's gonna get that money. And no government and all the governments combined cannot stop Jimmy legally from getting that $200, every last penny. If they do, there is a grave injustice, a grave injustice at hand. So this promised eternal inheritance we're reading about in Hebrews 9 is the biggest and the most valuable of any that there is. I simply don't have the words to say how valuable, how important, how important this is inheritance is it's eternal it's rooted in eternity right it's re eternal redemption the testator of this new covenant is the Lord Jesus Christ so remember who decides who gets what the testator eternal life is happening because a death has occurred a death has occurred indeed Christ's death and it is, it is his death that put this new and better and eternal covenant into actual force. And it eliminated or superseded the old one. This one's in force. So question should come up now because we're reading it in the verses. Who are those who are to receive the promised eternal inheritance? Who does the testator declare are his heirs? You know, is it a blank line in the document? Some, some, some theologies will say it is, right? You just, you just write your name in. It's your choice. Just write it in. But I don't believe this is true according to the text, right? That's not how wills and testaments work. No, verse 15 says, he says this, those who are called. Those who are called. God has a people from all eternity who he personally calls. This is amazing. And this call has life-giving power. This call has covenant-applying power. Theologically, it's referred to as effectual calling. Effectual calling. A person, humanly speaking, we are free 
to call everyone, other people, to repentance and faith in Christ for their eternal life. We're free to do that. We do that. But it may not be effectual, right? When God himself gives the call we're talking about, it is effectual. It is going to have its true effect. Jesus calling Lazarus out of the tomb. Remember that event, that miracle? He was in dead four days in the grave. What did he do? He called him out. That was a living parable of, of effectual calling right there. What happens to you and me, those who believe? So the Apostle Paul refers to this also in Romans 8. We just read it. In Romans 8, when he says, And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So those whom he predestined, he called. And they're going to be glorified. The, the called of God are the heirs of eternal salvation. And remember way back in chapter 1, what he, what he told us about who the angels minister to? Chapter 1, verse 14, they minister to those who are to inherit salvation. Those who are to inherit. We're talking about the heirs right here. He also said in chapter 3, you're called to a higher calling. You are called. So true reconciliation with God requires a call from God. Before you ever call upon him for eternal life, which you really do legitimately, but before you call upon him for real Salvation is because he made the first call. Because he said in Isaiah 55, said, My word, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty. It shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So that's what we're talking about. Those are the heirs. Now, now look at verses 18 through 22. This chunk... The author is explaining how both covenants were made effectual and official with the shedding of blood. The first covenant was inaugurated with blood. Now, inaugurate means the, the official starting point of something important. But it was, it was inaugurated with blood, not a handshake or a signature on a notarized document. No, blood, blood. And the old covenant ministry of the priests was indeed a very bloody process. Very bloody. Every single day and more so on certain times of the year, there is so much bloodshed of the calves and goats and these animals. The holy God of the universe requires blood for his covenants and for redemption. This is amazing truth to understand. All right, from the very moment, let's say Adam sinned, he and Eve tried to make things right or try to cover themselves with fig leaves, with leaves. That human effort, no, that wouldn't cut it. God took action and slaughtered an animal or animals and made garments of skins to clothe them. See, blood was involved. Bloodshed was involved. And an important covenant that God made with Abraham that through his seed, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Remember what he said? He, he said to take certain animals, not just one. He said take a heifer, a female goat, a ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he had them cut in half, all but the birds. But the other animals, he had cut in half. And this is getting to what we're talking about, even cut. The Hebrew, if you read it literally, when God makes a covenant, it says he will cut a covenant. This is giving us the picture. This is giving the imagery of blood, blood. He says the first covenant was inaugurated with blood. The law of God was handed down through Moses now. Through Moses, this is the first covenant. The mediator of that covenant was Moses. And then Moses gave it to the people and he had, he had it on stone tablets. And, but he also wrote, wrote down the law fully. And it says here in a book, he wrote it down. He inscripturated it. He wrote it all out. In, in written form. And Moses told exactly how to make the tent, which had the two holy rooms we discussed. And the author tells us here how all these things were sprinkled with the blood, with the blood of calves and goats, but using the hyssop branch 
and wool, which was scarlet in color, probably from being stained by blood. And he also used water, probably to make it sprinkleable. And it says it was used to sprinkle the book of the law and the ark of the testimony and the vessels used in worship and all the people were sprinkled with this blood. There was blood everywhere, everywhere. I mean, so often, just think of this, the sight of blood does something to us, doesn't it? A kid goes off and falls down and gets a boo-boo. They'll get up and run around, but if, if you say, hey, you're bleeding, all of a sudden it's like, ah! like they're, they're panicking, right? I gotta have a Band-Aid, the sight. It wasn't the feeling, it was the sight. Bump their head on something and it didn't hurt that bad. And walk in the living room and there's blood coming all down like that. I mean, it didn't hurt, but like the, pa- the parents in action. Why? Because they're seeing blood. It, it does something. And I don't think we quite understand the, the bloody and gory scene that would have been on display in the outer court there of the tabernacle. Charles Spurgeon said this, he said, he said, I suppose that the outer court of the tabernacle was something worse than an ordinary slaughterhouse. If you'll read the list of the multitude of beasts that were sometimes slain there in a single day, you'll see that the priests must have stood in gore and have presented a crimson appearance. Their snow white garments all splashed over with blood as they stood there offering sacrifice from morning till night. Every man who went up to the tabernacle must have stood aside for a moment and have said, what a place this is for the worship of God. Everywhere I see slaughter. And that's right, it's blood. It's everywhere. And this does not mean that God is some bloodthirsty God. He isn't. No, all of this blood is a reflection on our sin. That's what it is. It's reflecting your sin and mine. All this blood, all this death, all this gore. It's because of our sin and how bad our sin is. For the wages of sin is death. Death. That's, we're told that before God, this blood was purifying or purging. Isn't that something? You see that in verse 22. Under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. There are just a couple of little exceptions, some, some details that, that some fine flour and some water and certain things. But with regard to forgiveness of sin, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And now this is getting to the deepest problem that we have, our sin. And we need forgiveness. You've got to have forgiveness from God. You've got to have it or you will perish in hell. And there is this reality of the purging of our sins. He mentioned, the author mentions right at the beginning of the letter, after making purification for sins, he, Christ, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. For God's covenants to be in effect, to have any standing with him, a death has to occur. It's either your death or the death of another. And that's what all this blood signifies, death, death, the death of a sinless life making atonement for a sinner. And the closest living thing apparently to a sinless life would have been a cow or a sheep, goat, lamb. See, they don't sin before God. And, you know, it couldn't just be any cow, right? or any sheep, they had to be spotless without blemish, representing they are without sin. That's what it signified. But the blood of bulls and goats could never really take away sin. Couldn't do it. Not really. It never could, never, never has been understood that way. We know that, and God's people who lived back then knew that. 
Now, the blood of these sacrificial animals were all pointing to the heart of the gospel message and the blessings established in the new covenant. The priests and the high priests in those old covenant days, they were, they were the ones doing all the slaughtering of the animals and presenting the sacrifices before God. And this was all part of the old covenant agreement. But now, but now the Lord Jesus Christ is our great high priest and he's our mediator. And he has satisfied all the demands of the law against our sins from the smallest one to the greatest. And that smallest one will keep you out. He did it with his own blood. That's what we have to see today, with his own blood. A death has occurred indeed, and it was his death on the cross. See that? Our sins are that bad, that they require full satisfaction from God if he's ever to be at peace with us. He's, he cannot and will not pretend the sins didn't happen. We wouldn't be holy, but he is holy. Before any of God's blessings can come to us, our sins had to be dealt with, and we could never deal with them, not the smallest one. We couldn't deal with them on our own, which is why this has to be a mediated covenant. It has to be. Our Savior came willingly. Now, we need to remember that. He came and gave himself willingly. He wasn't kidnapped and taken against his will. Remember the soldiers they came? It's just an incredible scene. I've said it before in past studies, but they show up and he says, Who are you, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, two, he said three words, I am he. And what happened? The whole battalion fell down to the ground backwards. Now, you don't just do that to a battalion of soldiers, right? It would take a bomb or a earthquake or something. You don't just do that. And he did it with a, a single response with his He knocked the soldiers down, but then the, the decision maker, the Gentile decision maker, Pilate, what did he tell him? Remember? He said, the only authority you have has been given to you from God. And he also told them, if I wanted to, I could call down 12 legions of angels, a legion of angels, if I wanted to. Now, we know from the Old Testament what one angel can do. My, oh, my, what could that many angels do? So he's telling us, I'm coming of my own accord. I'm coming. So he is a willing sacrifice. He's not like the dumb animals that didn't know what was going on. He's coming willingly, and he knows what's going on. And he's giving himself... And he's doing it out of love for his father and out of, his lo out of love for his people. That's why he's doing it. For, he loves you. So he was, he was pierced for our transgressions. See, Good Friday was a bloody Friday for the Lord Jesus Christ. It was a bloody Friday. He, he was covered in blood for, in, from his head down to his feet. He's the object of all these types and shadows, right, of the Old Covenant. And this is what secured our eternal redemption. He has made us the heirs of eternal inheritance. In John's Gospel, if you read the end there, before Jesus died on the cross, he made sure his mother was taken care of. Isn't that amazing? He made sure his mother is taken care of. He, he asked John to look after her. And then he said, I thirst. And he received the sour wine. But then after that, he said three words. Remember what he said? It is finished. It is finished. Right? The ransom has been paid. Redemption is accomplished. The covenant was completed, sealed in his blood among all the witnesses in heaven and on earth. And the thought struck me in my study. Remember, he told us everything he speaks to us. He speaks from what he hears the Father say. I can only imagine his Father somehow, in that moment, or before that moment, 
stooping down, seeing his son, And saying something in his ears like this, Son, it is finished. The covenant's complete. I'm satisfied. The covenant is in force forever. Come home. Hallelujah. This new covenant, it, the triune God has agreed to give you so many blessings. So many. So many. He's putting it in, in, in these privileges are all given to us because of his blood. That's the only reason. He, the, the, his, the agreement was give them eternal redemption eternal life. Christ does not want you worried about dying. He wants you to have eternal life. That's in there. It's going to happen. He's the testator. It's going to happen. New heart. He wants you to have a new heart. You love God. You're going to a place you're going to love. You're going to love God. You're going to love his ways. You're going to love his laws. Give them a new heart. Regenerate them. Justify them. That's what he's promised right here in the covenant. Justification. The last will and testament is to remember your sins no more. I won't remember them ever again. Not the littlest, not the biggest one. I won't remember. In other words, it will not be brought up in the day of judgment against you. Why? Because the blood of Christ has covered it. That's the only reason why. But it's the best reason. The cleansing. Wash me. The cleansing of your soul and your conscience. Your conscience is washed in the blood of Christ. It's free. It is free. You don't have to worry about that bad thing. You repented of it. Leave it in the past. Like the Apostle Paul said, what's in the past, I'll leave in the past. I'm pressing on to follow my Savior to the end. And adopted. You're adopted into the home, into the family. You're welcome. You have full rights, full citizenship. You're an heir. You're a joint heir. You're loved with the love God loves Christ with. You're his. This is your home forever. This means that because of our great mediator, the author and finisher of our faith, and, the, and only because of him, we now have God as our God. You got the greatest thing ever. So, what about you? What about you, beloved? Are you, are you washed in the blood? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? You can never earn this. You can never earn eternal life, right? There's only one way to have it. It's through the blood. You can have all the blessings of the new covenant, but you have to realize only the blood makes them yours. Not your good works, not your good deeds, not any of that. This is a covenant of grace. That's it. And it's to be received freely. And this is the case for everyone who enters heaven. From the first man, Adam, all the way to the last. Everyone must be washed in the blood. And that's how, that's how they were all saved. You may be wondering, well, how did the people in the old covenant get saved? If it's by the blood of Christ. It's as simple as that. I don't think it needs to be complicated at all. They too were washed in the blood of the Lamb. Abraham was saved by Christ. Noah, all of them, they were saved by Christ. Remember, he's the Lamb slain as from before the foundation of the earth. So for them, it was, it was a future event. But for us, it's a, it's a, a glorious historical event. And on that cross, it's as though the Lord Jesus Christ reached all the way back to the first man, Adam, I believe. And then he also reached all the way forward to the very last of his elect, of those whom the Father has given him and saved them all. They're all washed in the blood, all of them. Amen. It, you may ask... And I hope some of you are. How can I be sure? 
Or how can I know I'm one of the heirs of salvation? To which I would ask you, do you want to be one? Is that your desire? Is that in your heart? Do you want to be one? Well, do you hear and understand the message of the blood? Do you believe it? Are you willing to look to the blood and, the, and only to the blood for your acceptance before God? Do you see in Christ your only hope of redemption and forgiveness? Only in him. You know, the Lord said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me, didn't he? So do you hear his voice? Are you hearing his voice saying, follow me? Look to the blood, listen to the message and follow me. Or do you want to get out of here as soon as possible? The only way to be in this covenant is by faith in Christ alone. And that is it. When you, when you see all the blood, the precious blood of Christ with the eye of faith, do you realize that there's nothing left for you to do? It's all paid. Jesus paid it all. We sing it. There's nothing left for you to do but to embrace him with a sincere faith. If so, you are among the heirs. I believe I have the authority to tell you now, you are among the heirs and you are saved if you're believing that. If you're laying hold of him, of Christ. And none of us are perfect either, right? We, we still are in the flesh. We still stumble and struggle with sin. Well, are you troubled from some sin today or yesterday? Some horrible sin that keeps bombarding you? Something, maybe a little thing you're bothered about? Well, look to the blood. That's the answer. You're going to find your comfort only there, in the blood. Are you struggling with your own personal assurance? Well, don't go looking within. Don't go looking at your works and your fruit. There's one place to go. Look to the blood of Christ. And this is where your assurance can start growing. There's a lot of things. Are you bitter? Are you just angry? Are you prone to anger? And you want other people angry and bitter and miserable with you for whatever reason the answer is only in the blood it's in the blood look to the blood remember the message of the blood we'll see it later the blood of christ speaks a nobler word than the blood of abel look to his sweet covenant read it right here in his last will and testament and find your hope find your peace find your joy Find your life. Find your everything. Find your forgiveness with God. All of it, all of it purchased by the blood. Amen. Just think of it. The one whom angels worship is your Savior. He upholds the universe. He's your Savior. He's made us join heirs with him. Father, bless this word to your people now. Take the truths of it, apply it to hearts and minds, to souls. We love you, we praise you, we thank you. And pray all this now in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.